Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, Garland Nixon. The fighting in Sudan continues as rival groups battle and external forces vie for influence. Also, China and Russia circle the wagons, and France may be on board for a multipolar world. Joining us to discuss this and uh, this week's big news stories is Dr. Gerald Horn. He's a professor of history at the University of Houston in Texas. He's an author, a historian, and a researcher. Dr. Horn, welcome back to The Critical Hour. Thank you for inviting me. You know, we have to start off with the big story for the, this week, and, and to me, what I think is an extremely important story, um, the Black Alliance for Peace has um, uh, released a statement on the um, indictment of the African People's Socialist Party, and they refer to it as a racist assault on the Black Liberation Movement. Your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Obviously, they have a good point when they make that point, but as we've been stressing over the last few days, we need to understand that this is a shot over the bow at the black community generally, at the anti-war forces generally, and that all of these forces, including the civil rights and civil liberties forces, must rally to the defense of Chairman O'Malley and his comrades. And I think we also need to put this into the context of other developments in recent weeks, because I think that they're all connected. What I'm trying to suggest is that I think that U.S. imperialism is in the throes of what is now being called a polycrisis, a multi-pronged crisis. And when imperialism enters a crisis, it tends to strike out blindly. It tends to search for scapegoats. It tends to throw the marginalized overboard, and the signs of this crisis are all about if we simply open our eyes. I refer to the comments, for example, of President Xi when he was departing Moscow, when he turns to President Putin and suggests that changes are afoot in the international community that have not been seen for a century, and that Russia and China are driving this change. Uh, This set off alarm bells in Washington. If you skim the Wall Street Journal since that comment was made, they mentioned it repeatedly as a kind of wake-up call. And then you have the comments of President Macron as he was leaving Beijing, where he suggested that France and indeed the European Union uh, should create a third pole equidistant between Washington and Beijing. And certainly, friends, in particular, should not necessarily follow Washington over the cliff with regard to this uh, crisis, this new Cold War uh, with China, uh, because France recognizes that the European Union is dependent upon the Chinese market to sell Airbus, that is to say, this joint EU project that implicates France, particularly since China's in the process of developing its own competitor to Airbus. And I think what's happening is that the pressure that China is placing on the North Atlantic countries is causing, if not taking advantage of fissures and splits between and amongst the North Atlantic countries, in fact, between and amongst uh, those who share the same government. I'm looking at Germany, uh, where Chancellor Schultz uh, took his own delegation Beijing a few months ago, and then just a few days ago, his foreign minister of Birba, who was much more hawkish towards China, uh, she came back ringing alarm bells about uh, the People's Republic, although it's clear that Volkswagen BASF and uh, the aforementioned Airbus would like to continue to enjoy the bounty of the Chinese market. And then there is Ursula von der Leyen, the German who heads the European Commission and accompanied Mr. Macron to China and has ambitions, we are told, of replacing Mr. Stoltenberg as head of NATO. Uh, She has been in the same corner as Madame Bierbach in terms of ringing alarm bells about the People's Republic of China. And strategically, What has been the result of the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the dissolution of the Soviet Union is that Eastern European nations have basically become acolytes of U.S. imperialism to the right 
of France and Germany on foreign policy. And they are the driving force in some ways on the European continent for this escapade in Ukraine. I'm speaking of Poland and Lithuania. Lithuania, of course, being particularly hostile to the People's Republic of China. It's Baltic neighbors, including Estonia and Latvia. And I think that our friends on the left who campaigned assiduously for the collapse of rule of communist parties in Eastern Europe, which has now led to the strengthening of U.S. imperialism, may want to rethink that historic decision that they made. And then there's what's on the front page of the New York Times this morning with regard to President Xi not returning the phone calls of Mr. Biden, who wants to engage. China sees no reason to engage because it has figured out that Washington is embarked on a new Cold War and does not want to play along with regard to the charade. And at the same time, if you flip pages and go inside the New York Times, you'll see a remarkable speech by Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, who at John Hopkins University, their campus in Washington, D.C., at the School of Advanced International Studies, backed away from the Biden line of decoupling suggesting that this would be disastrous for the United States and China. Of course, she's not concerned about China. She should have just said it'll be disastrous for the United States of America. And so if you add all of these factors together, you'll see that Washington is in the midst of a crisis and it's getting nervous. It recognizes historically that in terms of international crisis, The black community has not necessarily been a reliable ally for U.S. imperialism. And you now see that by targeting the African People's Socialist Party, which has been forthright in terms of rejecting the U.S. and NATO intervention in Ukraine, uh, they are seeking a sacrificial land. They are also seeking a scapegoat for its own created crises, and they plan to crucify Chairman O'Malley and his comrades so as to distract attention from Washington's own policy failures. And I'm afraid to say that if we do not rally to their defense, the worst may be yet to come. Now, here's something that's interesting I want to ask you about. I was doing a little bit of research today. Apparently yesterday, Glenn Greenwald was on the Tucker Carlson show, and both Glenn Greenwald and Tucker Carlson uh, defended um, uh, Chairman Yashatelli and his organization, talked about their constitutional rights, and, um, uh, you know, attacked the Biden administration for going after them. Then you go down and you find that Glenn Beck was on. And Glenn Beck, here's his quote, an extremely dangerous precedent by trying to turn four black socialist radicals into felons for speaking out against the war in Ukraine. I don't care what your politics are. We have a first, um, we have a first Amendment. Interesting that as the Democratic Party goes after them, that there would be uh, a, a Tucker Carlson and a Glenn Beck saying, no, this is wrong. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think that that reflects the point that the right wing in the United States, not least those who have been Trumpistas uh, in 2016, 2020, or since, feel that this war in Ukraine distracts focus from what they consider to be the main target, which is the People's Republic of China. I think that the Democratic Party, I'm afraid to say, is enmeshed in a crisis that even some of our friends on the left and comrades on the left do not care to recognize. What I'm referring to is that the right wing in the United States, the Republican Party, more specifically, feels more confident because it controls or it has the preponderance of support from the Euro-American settlers and their descendants across class lines. The Democrats have not won a majority of that constituency since the early 1960s. And in fact, in the Deep South, where you see the most heartfelt expression of what's described as U.S. patriotism, you see that the Republicans oftentimes win that settler vote by rates of nine to one or eight to two, for example, in Texas, from where I am now speaking. 
We should never forget that in 1991, a Klansman and a Nazi leader, David Duke, won 55% of the Euro-American vote in his race for governor. You could have had a Nazi ruling the Pelican State. And so as a result, because of the left being historically uh, hostile, generally speaking, towards U.S. imperialism, and the right wanting to focus on China, that has led to both of these forces criticizing the U.S. escapade in Ukraine. And indeed, if you look on the Washington Post website, uh, as we speak, you will see a lengthy article that's basically a nothing burger suggesting that in Germany, you also have forces on the left, that is to say, De Linke, the left-wing party uh, representing the Bundestag, and the alternative for Germany, the ultra-rightist party, uh, both expressing criticisms of the Ukrainian episode. What's interesting is that the Washington Post tries to act as if there's some sort of devil's bargain or Faustian bargain between the two. But I would dare say that just be, as you in the United, as we in the United States uh, see a similar constellation of forces, there's probably a similar constellation of forces in Germany. Uh, we should not be sh surprised by what you've just said about Glenn Beck and Tucker Carlson and their compatriots, uh, but at the same time, we should not suspect that there is some sort of bargain uh, between uh, the African People's Socialist Party and those noxious forces on the right. Ornoko Tribune uh, writes, and this is, was an important story this weekend. This was, I mean, over this week, Washington outraged by Lula da Silva's comments on peace in Ukraine. And uh, U.S. Um, representative said, despite declaring itself neutral in the geopolitical dispute between the United States and China, Brazil seems to have clearly aligned itself with China and Russia. They are very angry, but Lula da Silva saying, you know what, the global South got to get off of these dollars. It's not working out for us. Us. Your thoughts, sir? Well, that reflects the point that the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov just left Brazil en route to Venezuela and Cuba, where he is now conferring as we speak. What I envision sooner rather than later is a visit, yet another visit, uh, to Cuba uh, by President Putin. And I would imagine that he would then be followed by President Xi of China, who is not returning the calls of Mr. Biden, is already noted. I think that Brazil, they are following the news, like some of us, very carefully. They recognize the import and impact of that point that I made at the top of our conversation, made by President Xi on departing Moscow, that there are changes afoot in the international community, the likes of which we have not seen in a century, uh, I would make a friendly amendment to say the likes of which we may not have seen in a half a millennium, in 500 years. And when this well, once in a generation or once in multiple generational changes take place, uh, only the slow afoot fail to take advantage. Lula is not slow afoot. Uh, he is perceptive. That's why he just left China. That's why he's trying to move away from the dollar. That's why he was a moving force in forming the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which will be meeting in South Africa within months, along with the leaders of China and Russia. Washington can only grind its teeth in response and wring its hands. But as the saying goes, the dog barks, but the caravan moves on. Another very important story this week was in uh, in Sudan. Um, Daily Mail reports thousands flee, bodies on the streets in battle scarred cartoons. But it wasn't just Sudan. You know, it was the external forces at work. As you probably know, there's a significant um, uh, political, um, yeah, I might say, a revolutionary forces, shall we say, and leftist forces in in Sudan that always has been there. I, I would be, uh, uh, I would imagine the U.S. would be concerned that in the chaos they may take power or come to power. So, your thoughts on Sudan and, uh, of course, what external forces could be, you know, uh, up to no good in that country? 
Well, there are so many, I'm not even sure where to start. I mean, you mentioned the United States, and we should watch with careful scrutiny this news report that the United States has sent or has increased its forces already in Djibouti, but due east from Sudan, and is planning upon an evacuation of U.S. nationals who are in Sudan by the thousands. Uh, that could be the cover for U.S. boots on the ground, literally, that is to say, uh, for a disguised U.S. military intervention in the internal affairs of Sudan, because we know that U.S. imperialism is hysterical about the role of the Wagner Group, uh, headquartered in Russia, and also cited in neighboring Central African Republic. Uh, the United States also uh, has a hand, I'm afraid to say, in helping to beef up the forces of the uh, neighboring uh, Mr. Hiftar in Libya, due north of Sudan. He, of course, was once resided in Virginia, had known ties to the U.S. intelligence community, and is now said to be uh, sending material, military materiel uh, into Sudan. The same holds true for the U.S. cat's paw that is uh, General al-Sisi's regime in neighboring Egypt. And so we would be remiss if we failed to ignore, if we chose to ignore, I should say, this uh, interference in the internal affairs of Sudan. And instead, we should call for a ceasefire. Uh, we should uh, request that our comrades in the African Union uh, use their good offices headquartered in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, due east, to arrange mediation sessions between the warring factions. And certainly uh, that should be the call of the day. And certainly we should demand of the State Department and the Pentagon hands off Sudan. M.K. Bajra Kumar has a great uh, blog, Indian Punchline, and he writes, China, Russia, circle wagons in Asia, Pacific. Some interesting things have been going on there. Your thoughts? Well, uh, I'm sure I don't have to inform you, above all, of this loose talk in Washington about uh, inflicting war on China and escalating the proxy war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, I'm sure, about the military maneuvers taking place that have taken place off the southern coast of China uh, involving uh, Philippines forces. Uh, we know uh, that. Japan is bulking up its military. We noticed with concern and trepidation the point that the government in Seoul, South Korea, not only is in the process of turning against its major trading partners, speaking of the People's Republic of China, but at the same time is rather dangerously and perilously uh, creating a two-front conflict because to their north, is the Democratic People's Republic of, Con of, of Korea. And of course, uh, they have worsening relations with their other neighbor, uh, speaking of China. So it's understandable why this article suggests that China and Russia are circling the wagons. The problem, as pointed out on the front page, again, of the New York Times yesterday, is that uh, the United States is not confronting Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, they're confronting two major nuclear armed powers, speaking of Russia and China. We would hope that that basic reality has dawned on the hotheads in Washington. But since they seem to be so ignorant of reality and history, uh, we cannot be certain, and therefore we should act accordingly. We've been listening to Dr. Gerald Horn. He's a professor of history at the University of Houston in Texas. He's an author, historian, and researcher. You can find his books online, anywhere that books are sold, Amazon, etc. My favorite is the book about Paul Robeson. Go to Amazon, go to wherever books are sold, and, uh, and leaf through his books. I'm sure you'll find something that... 